on parade. Our story begins at the world's largest open pit iron mine in northern Minnesota, less than 200 miles from the Twin Cities. Here, a tremendous deposit of iron ore has waited thousands, perhaps millions of years, waiting for man to discover its usefulness. Modern M.M. farm machines and tractors are built from refined iron, steel and alloys, and for decades have led the quality and economy parade. Now, let's follow the raw material from the earth through rolling furnaces, then through a skillful process of manipulation by men and machines, until finally, you see the finished Twin City four-cylinder tractors. A truly great drama of power on parade. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
magic of modern industry changed crude ore into finished twin city tractors. Every one of them going out as a low-cost servant to the farmers of the nation. Now let's see how some of these train loads of twin city tractors make farming a pleasant and profitable business the year round. Jane. 
getting in kind of late tonight, Dan. I've been helping George Bonner, our dealer here, deliver several carloads of tractors today. And for the last three hours, we've been talking to Charlie Stewart. You know him. Trying to help him decide what size tractor to buy. Well, Charlie always was a careful buyer. He ought to buy a Twin City. Sure, I left the two of them together. And tomorrow, Charlie and I are going out and see some of our tractors that work in the field. I want to get an early start, too. Do you want to leave a call? Yes. 6.30, Bill. All right. Good, Good night. night. Now that's the kind of a thing I ought to have to run around in, an airplane. These automobiles are too slow for a guy that's got as many things to do as I have. I should take Charlie around tomorrow in an airplane. There's one of our Twin City tractors at work down there, Charlie. We'll go down and see it. Charlie, I want to show you first how powerful our Twin City tractors are. Here's a Universal J with rear wheels adjustable for both standard and wide tread from 54 to 76 inches. It's pulling a two-way Moline plow used for hillside plowing and irrigated fields, or in any condition where it's advisable to turn all the furrows one way. There's nothing else like it in the world, Charlie. There's no side draft, and it plows level at any depth. That's some outfit, Dan. And that J sure has got power. You bet it has, Charlie. Users call it a tumble bug. You saw the plow tumble and raise as he made the turn. And look how easily it handles. Another pull of the rope, and he can plow down the same furrow. The soil is plenty tough, and it takes a lot of power to do the kind of a job he's doing. Here's a J pulling a standard two-bottom Moline plow. Let's follow it, and you can see for yourself what a wonderful job of plowing it does. It sure does a fine job. Here we are near Holton, Kansas, and here's a Universal J pulling the famous Moline Wheatland disc plow. Notice the strip he's plowing. Some power, I'd say. It's a power lift plow, and you can sure cover a lot of ground in a day with an outfit like this. Moline Wheatland plowing is ideal here. It leaves the stubble standing up to hold the snow for moisture and to help prevent soil blowing. With the big 26-inch discs spaced 10 inches apart, you can plow up to 9 inches deep. This is the Universal M wide tread tractor pulling a Moline three-bottom plow. The M is larger and has more power than the J, but gives you the same Twin City economy and dependability. Charlie, here we are at the Walter Estes Farm at Scott, Arkansas. This Universal M is pulling a Moline VB Harrow. Farmers call this a Harrow plow because it does a thorough job in the toughest soil. And look at the job it's doing, and it penetrates just as evenly when turning. This Universal M is preparing a seed bed with a Moline single lever disc and drag harrow, and it does the job in a hurry. Now that's one of our standard tread models. We delivered it last spring, and it's doing a mighty fine job, too. Is that a Universal? No, that's a Twin City KT pulling a Moline disc. And Charlie, this is A.S. Vanderford's farm, Oklahoma City. Here he comes with his KT pulling a six-foot Moline Wheatland plow. The soil is really hard, and it takes this plow on a lot of tractor power to do a good job. The Twin City KT pulls three bottoms most anywhere. It's a real three-plow tractor. But here's a demonstration of lots of reserve power. A KT pulling five bottoms in hard, dry soil. It's only a test, but it's proof. 
Here we are on the Oklahoma-Kansas border. That's our four-plow Twin City FTA pulling a 10-foot Wheatland. But that's a bigger load than four plows. Well, some bigger. You know, farmers say that the Moline Wheatland plow just about cuts plowing costs in half. He's sure plowing a lot of ground. Look what's here. One of our old 40s. We haven't made them for 20 years. That's good proof of Twin Cities' reputation for giving extra years of service. Here's about the only large-sized modern tractor, our 2744. She'll spin the largest threshers and do all heavy-duty jobs with ease. And the Twin City 2744 easily pulls six plows, even when plowing the deepest under tough conditions. It has a world of reserve power. And speaking of reserve power, here we are on the William C. Nelson farm at Clearwater, Kansas. The sturdy Twin City FTA easily pulls this Moline five-bottom plow. The ground is plenty hard here, too, Dan. That's right, but Twin City tractors are built to do the work. And to prove power and durability, here's a dealer's demonstration of an FTA pulling eight 14-inch bottoms. Yet the tractor is built only to pull four or five bottoms. We don't recommend pulling seven or eight bottoms, but it's nice to know the power is there. Here's the MM Harvester, the combine that proved its superiority in the toughest harvest in a decade. Here's a KT pulling the harvester in soybeans. It's the king of soybean combines. Here's a Universal J pulling the MM Harvester. Notice how speedy it is and how easily it handles. Just watch this snappy turn. The Model J with the Harvester is the most modern harvesting outfit in the world. The Harvester is the most popular combine and it weighs nearly a ton less than the ordinary 12-foot machine. It gets the grain and does a better job of cleaning. Now, Charlie, Twin City engines are not only used in our tractors, but serve many of the large industries of the country. Here's one operating an irrigation pump in a rice field near Stuttgart, Arkansas. There are over 100 MM tractors and engines right here in this neighborhood. Many operate 24 hours a day, weeks at a time. Here in the rice fields, where the going is always tough, Minneapolis Moline Power leads the parade. Here in Chickasaw, Oklahoma, is one of the many heavy-duty MM engines operating cotton gins throughout the South. These big six-cylinder twin cities give the most economical power. In sawmills, too, at low-cost, dependable power. This job requires a smooth flow of power and lots of it. Twins fill the bill and keep the costs down. In this barge on the Arkansas River is another big six-cylinder twin city pumping sand from the river bottom. This takes plenty of power, Charlie. I didn't know you made engines except for tractors. We make them for a lot of different jobs. For nearly 30 years, there's been a big demand for Twin City engines wherever economical and heavy-duty power is needed. On highways, too, you'll find Twin City tractors. Here's one pulling a road grader just south of Topeka, Kansas. This is an FTA industrial model fleet owned by the Kansas Highway Department. And here's a Twin City that has been giving continuous successful service for eight years in the state of Mississippi. Have a look at the tools you get for use with our universal tractors. Here are the middle breakers with two or three bottoms, or you can use the lister bottoms. And you can get this Duchess sweep type planter in two or four row. Here's the four row check planter with exclusive rudder and payout stakes. Now this is the cultivator which you can get either as a two or four row machine. And this is the two and four row planting attachment. You can also get a mower and a bump rake attachment. These implements sell at a lower price than even horse drawn implements. You can't use all of these on your own farm, Charlie, but they're built so neat and trim and practical that I want you to see them at work. Let's nose down now and take a look at a few farms.
Like this two-row middle breaker, most universal implements fasten directly to the toolbar, clamped to the attacher. The attacher is the hitching device for these implements. Therefore, the parts needed to make each complete implement are few and inexpensive. It takes only a few minutes to attach or detach any universal implement. Notice the fine job this two-row is doing. You step on the power lift and it is raised or lowered. You can quickly change the two-row middle breaker to a three-row by simply adding the third bottom. And that, Charlie, costs only a few dollars. That's certainly sensible and simple, isn't it? It sure is, and what's more, it does a good job. And the whole machine is protected against breakage. If you hit a stone or stump, rather than breaking anything, the bottom swing back like a cultivator shovel. The Universal J Lister, the two and four row Duchess planter, and the knifing attachments are all protected this way. It takes just a minute or so to put the bottom back in operating position. Then you're all set to go. Well, Dan, that beats anything I ever saw. Now just take a look at the beautiful job of bedding you can do. You can also get a similar two or three row middle breaking attachment for the Universal M tractor. Here's a Universal M pulling a two-row middle breaker on the E.N. Fant Farm at Cahoma, Mississippi. The going is tough and it takes a lot of power, but the Universal does the job well. When beds are made up during the fall and winter, a crop of weeds often begins its growth before the planting season. It is then profitable to surface cultivate the beds before planting. Just put on these inexpensive knife attachments in place of the bottoms. You can then do a hurry-up job of cleaning out weeds. Say, your universal system of implements is almost human, Dan. The whole idea is to make farming easier and more profitable. This man made a lister planter out of his two-row middle breaker with high-speed bottoms by adding the planting and driving attachments and straight shanks. If he had had regular lister bottoms, he could have done the same thing by also replacing the middle breaker bottoms with lister bottoms. Here's a farmer changing his two-row universal lister into a two-row Duchess sweep-type planter by simply changing bottoms. Now, it costs only a few dollars to have both machines, and changing from one to the other takes only a few minutes. Here he is with his Duchess planter ready to finish the planting in a hurry. Notice he is planting on top of the beds. You can also get this sweep-type planter, Charlie, in a four-row model. If you have a two-row and want a four-row, you can have both by buying a few extra parts. The cans, by the way, each hold a bushel of seed. If you buy a four-row and want a two-row, simply take off the two outside openers and cans. Either the two or four-row is easily put on or taken off. You can finish planting in a hurry with a four-row outfit like this. It plants the seeds accurately and at uniform depth. The gauge wheels accurately control the depth of planting on both smooth and rough ground. And the entire planting mechanism is recognized as the most accurate made. Similar sweep type planter equipment can be obtained for the Universal M tractor. Now let's take a look at some Universal cultivators at work. Later we can see how easily and quickly they are attached. Here's a Universal J cultivating small corn. Notice the fast clean job it does. It handles small cotton just as well and just as fast and saves the plants. The gangs are adjustable to rows spaced from 30 to 42 inches apart. When the plants are taller, you can cultivate even faster. The Universal J has fuel speeds from 2 to 5 miles per hour, assuring fast, clean cultivation when it will do the most good. Every year, more farmers demand these Minneapolis Moline outfits to keep their fields cleaner at lower cost. Today's methods are a far cry from the one-row, one-mule cultivating methods of not so many years ago. That's a pretty sight, Dan, but I couldn't make any money farming that way. I should say not. Just take a look at this, Charlie, for a comparison in speed. And here's another Universal J with a four-row cultivator. Many of these four-row outfits cultivate from 50 to 60 acres a day. 
using a little more than one quart of fuel per acre. You'll appreciate an outfit like this on hot days when mules and horses can't keep going, when the cultivation does the most good. You've got to keep going on hot days, and you can do it with a universal outfit like this. Morris Horn, who owns this outfit, established one of the best records around Alex, Oklahoma, for low-cost operation and speedy, clean work at just the right time with his Universal J in equipment. Both the Universal J and the Universal M, two and four rollivators, have independent depth regulating gauge wheels for each gang. Once set, there are no adjustments to make. Each gang works independently and follows the contour of the ground. Notice the simple, durable construction. Mr. Estes, the owner, cultivates 60 acres a day with this Universal M outfit, and in heavy, sandy soil, uses less than one-third gallon of distillate per acre. Charlie here is a beautiful crop, kept clean at low cost by a Minneapolis Moline Universal outfit. Here's a planter that owners of the Universal J&M like, especially those who drill plant on top of beds or on unbedded fields. All you buy is the seed cans, openers, and driving mechanism. Just take off every other gang, and this drill planter fits right onto your cultivator frame and gangs. This is a Universal M, but a similar planter attachment can be had for the Universal J cultivator. It takes just a few minutes to change the cultivator into a planter. You can use it either as a two or four row, depending on which cultivator you may have. That's simple, and it can't cost much either. It doesn't cost as much as a four row horse planter what? Now the gauge wheels accurately regulate the depth of planting. A touch on the power lift raises the gangs high above the ground. You swing around, and another step on the power lift pedal sends the four gangs back to work. Here's a planter where all four cans and openers are in full view, so you can see just what you are doing. Charlie looked this four-row check planter over carefully. It's quickly put on, no bolts, no nuts are used. Just slip a few pins into place and you're ready to go. You can get a planter like this for either the Universal J or the Universal M tractor. These planters have the Moline World Champion check planting mechanism. The planter swings free from the tractor when in an operating position, but when you raise it, it becomes rigid with the tractor for quick, short turns. Notice the long rudder that keeps the planter traveling in a straight line so you always get straight rows and good cross-check. Watch the operator zigzag the front wheels to show that the rudder keeps the planter in a straight line. This is one of the many features making the MM planter the most popular. Another exclusive feature of the MM Universal check planter is the payout stake. It does away with wire drag and assures a good cross-check the full length of the field. This ratchet keeps the stake from paying out when planting away from the stake. Just slip the wire into the check head and you're all set to go. It's all very simple because the stake is set directly in line with the check head. In leaving the stake, the pull is straight so the wire does not pay out. But as you approach the stake, there is a side pull on the wire which releases the ratchet and permits the stake to pay out in such a way as to give a straight wire planting job the full length of the field. After the ratchet is released, the payout tension always remains the same, and the stake pays out exactly enough and no more than necessary. With these MM planters and these exclusive payout stakes, you get as good a cross-check and as accurate a job of planting as you ever did with a two-row horse planter. And this planter does it about three times as fast. You can make snappy short turns taking little room. You'll appreciate this modern machine when time is all important. These planter and other universal tools are raised and lowered by a simple power lift backed by five years of success. Charlie, you've seen the universal cultivators at work. Now here you can see how easily they are attached in a few minutes. This is a two row, but whether you have a two row hand lift or a two or four row power lift, you attach one side at a time. Simply drive up to each half of the cultivator, slip a few pins into place, and you're ready for business.
If you have a two-row and later want a four-row, all you have to buy is the two outer gangs. These are easily and quickly attached to the inside gangs using only a few bolts. Here you see exactly how this is done. Even if you plant with a two-row planter, you can use the cultivator as a two-row when cultivating in the direction that the corn is planted. And as an extra time saver, use it as a four-row when cross-cultivating. Watch the gangs raise as he steps on the power lift. Now let's go out to the field and watch it work. This must be second cultivation, Charlie. He's sure doing a nice, clean job, and doing it in a hurry, too. Yes, and he doesn't have to stop at the ends, either. He steps on the power lift, swings around, and without stopping, cultivates four rows at a time. Notice the flexibility which permits all shovels to cultivate at uniform depth at all times. The gauge wheels accurately control the depth of cultivation. Over rough ground, the parallel lift construction allows all shovels to penetrate at a uniform depth. Do your universal cultivators have enough clearance? Just look at this. Here's real clearance for you. I'll say that's clearance. I thought it was a man on a horse. That was a universal J. Now take a look at this four-row universal M in a field of cotton. Notice how much clearance it has. Good clearance is a real feature of our cultivators. Now here's an example of how fast you can cultivate. Many farmers cultivate from 50 to 60 acres a day with this outfit and do an excellent job. The operator has perfect cultivating visibility because all the gangs are in front of him. There's nothing in the way. With good clearance, perfect visibility, and quick, easy steering, you can get the weeds and save the crop. When it comes to haying, you can quickly attach this modern seven-foot mower driven by the power takeoff. In a few minutes, you're off to the field, ready to cut from 25 to 35 acres a day. This is a Universal J outfit, cutting a seven-foot swath in a heavy stand of alfalfa. You can get a similar seven-foot mower for the Universal M and KT tractors. An automatic slip clutch prevents damage in case something that cannot be cut gets into the sickle. The safety release trips if a hidden stump or stone is hit by the sickle bar. The bar is thrown backwards as it strikes the hidden obstacle, and it takes only a minute to put it back in operating position. You can turn square corners with this outfit and cut all the hay. When you're through cutting, the mower can be quickly detached. After raking the hay with a Moline side delivery rake, this farmer attached his Minneapolis Moline buck rake to his Universal J. That is hay stacked in half the time it used to take. Look at the load on the buck rake. That's a fast way to put up hay. It sure is. If you decide to get the high clearance KT tractor, you can get a buck rake like this for it too. Bailing hay is another power takeoff job you can handle with any Twin City tractor. You can do all the power takeoff jobs with your MM tractors. You've seen speed and power in the field, Charlie. Now look at some speed and power on the road. This farmer does his hauling jobs in a hurry with his Universal J on rubber. He doesn't need a truck. Here's the Universal M operating the new MM corn picker, Charlie. It's built almost entirely of steel, making it stronger and lighter. It is driven by takeoff and can be used with any standard or wide tread tractor. It is not only built to last, but get your crop the way you want it. The picking rolls are longer on the MM to get the low hanging ears. And notice how they assure that the high ears are snapped off in a hurry too, without excessive shelling. These four snapping rolls are almost 54 inches long and revolve on high grade roller bearings. They snap the ears off the stalk at just the right time so they fall at once into the elevator and are carried to the husking rolls. Here, 12 36-inch long husking rolls do a fast, clean job of husking. Underneath the husking rolls is an extra-large corn saver so that the small amount of corn that is shelled is saved. Remember, Charlie, the MM has 12 full-length husking rolls and so does a better job without clogging. 
It's the most up-to-date two-row picker with many exclusive features. When you need a picker, you should get an MM. Here you see the big capacity Minneapolis sheller at work, handling over 1,000 bushels per hour. With an MM, you can shell both snapped and husked corn. You get clean corn. The cobs are not broken to bits, and all silks, chaff, and dust are removed by the blower fan. Minneapolis Moline cylinder shellers are the most popular big capacity shellers backed by 30 years of success throughout the corn belt. This is a big capacity Model B equipped with rubber tires. You can also get a Model A, a somewhat smaller machine of the same type. Hauling jobs are done at low cost with MM tractors. This FTA is moving a big capacity Minneapolis sheller from one job to another. On the belt, too, Twin City tractors give low-cost, dependable power. This is Art Rowland's FTA, operating his standard Minneapolis thresher on William Beisman's farm at Malacca, Minnesota. Nearby, we see Wilson Brothers' KT tractor and Minneapolis special thresher on the P.E. Anderson farm. They say that with their outfit, they can thresh faster and cleaner than a lot of larger outfits and get around faster, too. Here is Samuel Sparks, Jr. of Lincoln, Illinois, telling another farmer how little fuel he uses. And believe me, there's plenty of long straw going through his 11-year-old M.M. thresher. This Universal J replaced a 15-year-old Twin City because the owner could do so many more things with this modern Twin City on all farm jobs the year round. What kind of fuel are these tractors burning? Pretty hard to say. Twin City tractors burn distillates, kerosene, and gasoline. It all depends on the difference in price of fuels. Let's float down here now. Now, Charlie, take a look at this Twin City hot spot manifold. This adjustment is on hot, which means that all the exhaust gases must pass around this hot spot in the manifold. With this hot setting, you can efficiently burn tractor distillates. The exhaust gases pass around this hot spot on the manifold. These gases passing around this hot spot keep it at a uniform temperature of around 200 degrees. This gives the maximum heating to the fuel before it passes into the cylinder. And this is the setting you need to burn completely heavy fuels such as distillate and furnace oil. Now, I've set this patented Twin City manifold at medium, and only half the exhaust gases pass around the hot spot of the intake manifold. Consequently, the fuel that passes into the cylinder is only medium heated. This is a good setting for kerosene or when you use gas in cool weather. Turn this manifold setting to cool, and none of the exhaust gases pass around the hot spot. This is the correct setting for ordinary gasoline burning. It is important when burning gasoline that you do not heat the fuel too much. If you do, you lose power. Your own automobile has less power on hot days, but runs smoother and with more pep on cool days. It is important also when burning distillates to have plenty of heat to gasify all heavy fuel particles. This patented Twin City manifold makes it possible to burn gasoline, kerosene, or distillate according to the season of the year. Notice how much you can vary the heat of fuel in the intake manifold. Set it cool, the thermometer registers 110 degrees. Now we'll turn the setting to hot in order to burn furnace oils and distillates. Watch closely. The thermometer climbs to 200 degrees. Well, this patented Twin City manifold is a real feature of our tractors. Now, Twin City tractors have a full pressure oiling system with a pump located in the base pan. The oil pump in the base pan forces the oil to all main and connecting rod bearings, the camshaft bearings, the valve mechanism, and timing gears. All working parts operate constantly in a fresh supply of oil, regardless of the angle at which a Twin City tractor is working. This is the same type of oiling system as is used in high-priced automobiles and heavy-duty engines. In addition, all Twin City tractors have a large-size oil filter and pressure regulator. 
this modern lubrication system assures all Twin City tractor owners extra years of use. There goes a Twin City tractor pulling an all-steel Moline monitor drill. Everybody knows about Moline monitor drills. Say, Dan, it's unusually dusty here, isn't it? Unusually dusty conditions don't bother owners of Twin City tractors, Charlie. Look at this chart. Here's how dust and grit are kept out of Twin City tractors by scientific sealing. Long life compressed felt bushings keep dust and dirt from entering around shafts, axles and bearings where they enter the housings. Filter type breathers keep dirt out of the crankcase. Fuel and oil filters keep dirt from entering at other points. The average farm tractor operates in very dusty conditions and has to take in thousands upon thousands of cubic feet of this air every day. On twin Z tractors, this air is thoroughly cleaned before it enters the carburetor by the most efficient air cleaner of extra large capacity. First, the large centrifugal cleaner eliminates the heavier particles of dust and grit. Then the air passes down the center intake tube to the larger capacity oil wash cleaner where a bath of oil removes the finer particles of dust and grit. Then fine mesh screens remove the fine oil bubbles from the oil washed air. Then this clean air goes to the carburetor free from destructive dust and grit. This is another reason why Twin City tractors give extra years of use. Here we are on the California Packing Corporation farms at Rochelle, Illinois. You know, Charlie, the best proof of the quality of any tractor is the way owners buy the same make time after time. The California Packing Corporation bought their first Twin City tractor in 1919. Since then, they've added to their tractor fleet ten times. Each time, they specify Minneapolis Moline tractors. Until now, they have 178 Twin Cities, and not one has been a replacement. This fleet is the finest proof that Twin City tractors are dependable and satisfy in every way. Del Monte's experience over a 17-year period has proved that MM tractors are the most economical and the most dependable. You see, when not only one tractor, but a whole fleet of 178 MM tractors continues to deliver excellent service under tough conditions, something very definite has proved about tractor dependability and economy. And Charlie, even more important is the fact that Del Monte results are the same as the experience of thousands of individual Twin City tractor owners the world over. Every year, more and more farmers look at these records of tractor experiences and decide to own a Minneapolis Moline tractor. MM tractors are quality built for dependability, economy, and long life. They have earned a reputation for giving three extra years of use the world over. I've seen enough, Dan. Let's go back and write up the order. All right, Charlie. Hang on, Charlie, we're falling. Hello. Hello, hello. Say, Dan, this is George. You don't have to get up so early tomorrow. Charlie just gave me his order. It's a cash deal. You are telling me? I darn near killed myself getting that order lined up for you. What the deuce are you talking about? Oh, I must be <laughs> Skip it. See you tomorrow. Okay, Dan. Good night. Good night. Jane, you said call 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock? All right, Dan. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Charlie. You've just bought an honest-to-goodness, dependable tractor. 
Well, George, any farmer that wants a quality tractor at the right price ought to buy a Twin City. I thought before talking to you and Dan that Twin City tractors were more expensive than others. Well, you found out differently now. And say, Charlie, may I put this sign up on your fence tomorrow when I deliver your tractor? Sure, George. I'd be glad to have the neighbors know that I bought a Twin City tractor. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you are about to see the most stupefying magic show ever performed. Startling tricks that defy the imagination. Watch closely, everybody. I take this plain piece of newspaper and roll it into a cone. And here, a full pitcher of milk, I slowly pour into the cone. I shall now stare with my magic wand tap it, and now a beautiful bouquet of flowers. The milk, it's vanished. The magic cooking pot, empty. Well, to cook we need a little heat. What will we use for heat? Ah, this piece of paper will do. I light a match. I wonder what's cooking. Let's see. The wonderful squared circle. The square is empty. The circle is empty, too. A few magic words, alakazam, alakazoom, abracadabra, and behold, silks from nowhere. How's that? Maybe there's more magic in the box. Let's see. Ah, yes, a rabbit. But it's not alive. Maybe my magic hat can help me. It's empty. But don't worry, I will bring this rabbit to life. Here it is. My rabbit! Tommy Martin, how dare you play tricks with my darling little Popeye? Yeah, Mom, how was it? Did you like it, Uncle Jim? No, I'll say I did, Tommy. It was worth coming all the way back here for just to see that show. Well, Jim, we're glad something brought you back. It's good to have all of us together again. It sure is. You know, it seems just like yesterday. We were kids playing together on the farm and getting into mischief. You remember when we went over to McGee's barn and... <coughs> <laughs> yes. But you're looking at solid, upstanding citizens now, Jim. Why, Bill's done such a good job selling farm machinery, he's just added a new display room on his store. I'm afraid. Well, we call Fred the Answer Man, like that fellow on the radio. As our county agent, he's still just as interested in any new things as when Miss Otis taught him reading, writing, and arithmetic. Good old Miss Otis. Say, what was it we used to call her? Never mind, Jim. You never were a very good example for the children then or now, I'd say. Oh, Mom, Uncle Jim is so a good example. I want to be like Uncle Jim when I grow up. Well, what makes you say that? I don't know exactly, Uncle Jim. I guess it's because you make things. It's not like farming, is it, Uncle Jim? Here. Yeah. What's going on here? Well, Jim, Tommy's beginning to think that after he finishes school and the university, he won't want to become a farmer. He's 
going to be a magician. No, I'm not. I want to work in a great big factory, the way you do, Uncle Jim. If you ask me, Tommy, you better stick to farming. But Uncle Jim, why? You're not sorry, are you? I should say not. I like to make things people use. That's what I mean, Uncle Jim. Yeah, but Tommy, you've got the same opportunity in agriculture, and there's a new future in farming. Oh, shucks. Farming's nothing but the same old corn and wheat every year, and it always will be. I don't go along with you there, Tommy. But Uncle Jim, someday we're not going to need nearly so many farmers anymore. Dad, you said that two men in town one day, didn't you? Wait a minute, Tommy. We may not need so many farmers to raise food in the future, as your dad said, but we'll definitely need a new kind of farm. A kind I think you'd like to be. Because there's magic in the crops he grows. You know about that, Tommy. We've talked about soybeans and how they're used to make many things. That's what your Uncle Jim means. Why, today, Tommy, there are thousands of farm makers that are just as much a part of industry as any foundry or assembly line. Oh, come on, Uncle Jim. Dad's got over a hundred acres, and I bet there isn't one that's really part of industry, like you say. Well, what do you do with a boy like this? Take him up on it. Go ahead, Jim. All right, Tommy. I'll take that bet. Now, uh, first, you'll admit, won't you, that there are many things on farms that have always been used for other purposes than food. All right, let's take an example or two. Vines were used to bind early tools. And you know how long trees have been used for shelter. Animal fats were used to make soaps and candles, and animal wool and plant fibers to make clothing. But man's needs became bigger and bigger. Goods had to be manufactured in greater quantity and greater variety. Industry's demand for raw materials increased many times. Research enabled agriculture to supply a great many of these raw materials right from the crops the farmers were growing. Now, to understand how that came about, it's important to know what a plant consists of. Cellulose and lignin form the solid framework or cell walls. Sugars are the main food in the plant's diet. From surplus sugars, the plant forms starch, which it stores for future use in the bulbs and seeds and fruit. Now, fats and oils are also produced in the plant and usually stored in the seed. And then there's protein, the most important part of any living cell. These are the main constituents of any plant. The chemist, when he examines a plant, tries to find new uses, either for the plant itself or the substances which compose it. Then he goes further, and an elementary process of nature helps to explain his next step. When plants are eaten by animals, the animal's stomach becomes a factory, which changes the plant's cellulose, sugars, and starches, and so on, into new products, such as milk, fat, leather, and wool. Man, with his knowledge of chemistry, also can change nature's basic building materials into new and useful products. And so, the ever-renewable plant substances of agriculture have become an inexhaustible supply of raw materials for industry. And this is the idea we call farm chemergy. So now, Tommy, let's come back to that old corn you think so little of. Why, that crop gives us almost all our starch. It takes a million and a half acres of corn alone, as many acres as the whole state of Delaware to give us all the starch we need. And no wonder. Industry in this country uses 1,600,000,000 pounds of starch every year. Your mother can tell you about starching her laundry. Well, in our big cities, commercial laundries use enormous quantities of starch. And even more starch is used in the manufacture of cloth itself. Starch gives cotton threads resistance to abrasion and the necessary strength to withstand the tension of the loom. Without starch, the yarn would unravel and break, and the loom would be stopped. Starch is also used in the paper industry. Starch binds the pulp fibers and strengthens the sheet so that it can withstand the manufacturing processes that follow. And in order to cast metal, 
for instance, in the mass production of automobile and airplane engines, sand mixed with starch is placed around a pattern. This mixture, when baked, makes a permanent mold, thanks to the adhesive property of the starch. And starch is even present in the medicine cabinet. It's the binding material in tablets, which holds the medicinal ingredients together. Then there's a new and growing industry that deals in prepared foods. It uses 250 million pounds of starch each year. Prepared foods like puddings, custards, soups, sauces, and salad dressings contain starch as a thickening agent. In short, starch is an important industrial raw material and nature alone has been able to provide it. But the camera just isn't satisfied to stop with starch. Through chemergy, this same starch can be used to produce sugars. And so we get other important industrial raw materials, corn syrup and a pure sugar called dextrose. These are used in tremendous quantities by the prepared food industry for canning, baking, candy, ice cream, and soft drinks of all kinds. And believe it or not, there's this kind of sugar in cigarettes too. Besides flavoring the tobacco, the sugar helps to retain moisture. And there's even sugar in the soles of your shoes. New shoes used to squeak, and they were stiff as boards. But now, sugar forced into the leather makes the soles pliable and prevents them from squeaking. But the most vital need for dextrose is in the human body. A solution of dextrose, or glucose, as it's sometimes called, is often injected directly into the bloodstream when strength must be rebuilt quickly. Today, injections of dextrose are routine treatments in surgical and injury cases. And the corn kernel holds still more magic. It contains an interesting protein called zine, with many uses in industry. Zine, when mixed with alcohol and rosin, can be made into a liquid more economical than shellac and used for coating floors and wood surfaces. As part of the materials which go into the making of phonograph records, zine helps to hold the shape and strength of the finished disc. Printing inks made with zine dry quickly, speeding production from the presses. They so see, Tommy? In just the tiny corn kernel, the farmer grows essential raw materials like starch, syrup, sugar, and zine for many industries. You're a magician. How's that for magic? That's something, all right. Jim, you mentioned a good number of industries, but you forgot one I can think of right away. Tractors? No, Tommy. But dealing in power equipment, I'm bound to know something about the oil industry. You know you couldn't drive an automobile or a tractor without fuel and lubricating oils. These, of course, come from natural petroleum deposits deep in the earth. But here again, starch is used. As the drill bites deeper and deeper, a drilling fluid is used to lubricate the drill head and to prevent overheating. But this fluid tends to seep away through the sides of the well, weakening the wall so that they may even collapse. By adding starch to the drilling fluid, the sides of the well are sealed. Fluid loss and the danger of collapse are prevented. And here's a way we farm equipment retailers are putting corn cobs to work. When the cobs are ground up and mixed with rice hulls, we get a soft grit blasting material. This will do a thorough job of removing the hard, thick carbon deposits on cylinders, pistons and bearings without the danger of pitting the highly polished surfaces. That's the way I did the last overhaul on your dad's tractor engine, Tommy. Speaking of tractors, you know there are certain engine parts like gears, gaskets, and insulating materials which could very well come from the farm. And Tommy, that starts us off on another magic crop, cotton. Seems a long way from cotton to gears in a tractor, for instance, but today, cotton is put to all sorts of other uses besides clothing. When layers and layers of cotton fabric coated with a plastic material are treated with heat and pressure, 
we get a solid plastic which is extremely strong, but also extremely light. It can replace lightweight metals to make an endless number of things. And today, there is even a new use for the shorter cotton lint fibers unsuited for spinning. These are made into bats used to insulate against heat and cold in the walls and roofs of buildings and in refrigerated freight cars where their light weight is an advantage. Cotton linters, the extremely short fibers adhering to the seed, were until recently practically useless. They too have become important, not because they are fibers, but because they are about 80% cellulose. When these cellulose-rich linters are treated with different acids, new raw materials result. When cellulose acetate is made into a thick liquid and forced into the air through tiny holes, it will form threads, which, when woven, give us all sorts of rayon fabrics. From these cellulose raw materials, we also make motion picture films, plastic articles of enormous variety, quick drying lacquers which speed up mass production in many industries, and explosives with hundreds of farm uses. The dairy farmer, too, plays his part in industry. From the many millions of pounds of skim milk available each year, a protein called casein can be separated. Casein, because of its adhesive property, is made into a water-resistant glue, and it also finds use in water paints as a binder for the color pigment. Large quantities are used to coat special printing papers so that they will take ink properly, and to make plastics used primarily for buttons, buckles, knitting needles, and novelties of all kinds. A brand new product from casein is a fiber called Aralac, with most of the qualities of wool. When mixed with other fibers, Aralac can be woven into a variety of attractive fabrics which give us new and different effects. Of course, corn and cotton and milk are obvious things for the chemurgists to work on. But maybe we're overlooking some things that are often discarded on a farm. Mm. There is an awful lot of residue on a farm. Some 200 million tons every year. About two tons of residue for every ton of food produced. Say, uh, don't forget residue isn't necessarily waste. After all, I use my corn stalks and my straw in many ways. But I do think we farmers should take stock and see if we're putting our residue to its best use. Bill told us already there are industrial uses for corn cobs. And I've heard there's even a use for chicken feathers. They're beginning to make them into another new yarn, also like wool, that's good for all sorts of clothing. And industry uses a lot of wheat straw each year. About 500,000 tons go to make paper, corrugated fiberboard for shipping cases, cardboard for egg case fillers, and building board. Building boards are also made from corn stalks and the stalks of the sugar cane. Straw and stalks contain large amounts of cellulose, which we know is a basic raw material for many products. So far, we've talked about staple crops and farm residues. Fred, how about telling us a little about some of the new experimental crops that are being developed? Well, there are several hundred thousand kinds of plants growing all over the world. Only about 15,000 of them were originally found in the United States. Experts believing that many foreign plants might have good possibilities in our own country began a number of years ago to bring them here from all over the world for experiment, testing, and development. From China came the tongue tree. And from Northern Europe, the rape plant. The industrial value of these plants is chiefly in their oils. India contributed a pod-bearing plant called guar. A starch-like material in its seed can be used to make papers, cosmetics, and many drugstore products. And from Russia came a dandelion called kagsagiz, which has rubber in its roots. Two large rubber companies have already made tires from this rubber. From China came another promising plant called ramy. Fibers from the ramy stalk are used in sails because they are strong and light. And they are used to make marine ropes, 
nets, and fishing lines because they are stronger wet than dry and will not rot. Crops with names like Ramey, Guar, and the others may not seem very important to most farmers right now, but think what it would mean to the cotton farm or the wheat farm if any of today's new crops could turn out to be a profitable secondary crop and do the job the soybean does for the corn farmer. Why, within the memory of all of us, except Tommy or Sue, the soybean was a new crop just like those others. In 1925, farmers were growing five million bushels. In 1945, soybean production reached 200 million bushels. And so today, the soybean is one of America's major crops. Besides its importance for animal and human nutrition, the soybean has found all sorts of industrial uses. Automobile production is a good illustration of its versatility. Soybean oil is used as a binder for the sand molds in the foundry. A material removed from the bean is used in car lacquer. Horn buttons, light switch covers, window trim are all made of soybean meal. And now they've even developed a fiber from the soybean protein that can be used for upholstery. The soybean's record from new crop to major crop in 25 years might well be repeated with some of today's new crops bringing new opportunities and new sources of income to the farmer. And here's something to remember. The soybean only became a major crop after suitable harvesting equipment was developed. That's why the farm equipment industry is constantly studying new crops to anticipate the farmer's needs for new machinery. Yes, it's through cooperation like that between farmers and industry and government that chemistry will achieve still further goals in the future. Scientists are constantly at work to plan needed research. This research is carried out by hundreds of industrial labs state agricultural colleges, and by the four large regional research laboratories of the United States Department of Agriculture. These labs were set up in 1938 to study new uses for farm products in each region. Here is one of these $2 million laboratories. One wing is devoted entirely to test tube research, where new commergic ideas are first developed. Here, scientists conduct an endless variety of experiments to analyze different plants and develop their industrial possibilities. Promising lab discoveries must then be proved practical for commercial manufacture. So in the other wing is the pilot plant, actually a well-equipped factory that bridges the gap between the test tube and the commercial use. Factory equipment is used to test on a commercial scale the new products and methods of manufacture discovered in the laboratories. In addition, many industrial companies use their regular commercial machines for tests on a still larger scale. Clearinghouse for all information about commercial research and achievements is an organization of industrialists, farmers, and scientists called the National Farm Commercial Council. So thanks to scientific research, in which industry has played a tremendous part. Farm chemistry in a very few years has grown from just an idea to a well-accepted fact. And Fred, in addition to research, there are two industries, the petroleum industry and the farm machinery industry, that play a direct role in the development of chemistry. We know that chemistry depends on efficient farming. The farmer knows that efficient farming depends on mechanical power. Power helps him to take care of his soil. Power helps him to grow better crops and to grow them more profitably. And because of mechanical tools and power, farmers today are able to get bigger yields from each acre of land. This means that we can grow enough food to take care of our needs and still have fertile land left to grow crops for industry. Mechanical power has also made manpower available for this new work. One man today, with the proper equipment, can do the work which required many men just a few years ago. The farm machinery companies have been working constantly to develop new machines and to improve the equipment at the farmer's disposal. They have developed high compression engines of greater efficiency to save the farmer time and money on every job he does. 
high compression engines designed to burn gasoline for greater convenience and economy. The oil companies have also been carrying on a continuous research program to supply better products for the farm. Not only have they improved gasoline to run the high compression engines, but better oils and greases and gear lubricants to prolong the life of all equipment. And new products to help the farmer in many ways. Rust preventatives, stock sprays, insecticides to name just a few. All industries are vitally interested in the future of agriculture. They know that the prosperity and the future of our entire country is based on a sound, prosperous agriculture. That's why businessmen, bankers, and manufacturers are all working with us in the development of farm chemistry. I guess not one of us here in this room has any doubts now that industry needs and uses farm products. And since that's the case, we know the farmer actually does play a part in making things just as any man in the factory. Sure. And what's more, farm chemistry has opened up a whole new future for farming. Why, the research that's going on in our labs isn't just for today. It's for tomorrow, the next day, and a hundred years from now, when agriculture will be called upon to supply a still larger part of industry's needs. And farm chemistry means all sorts of new products that make living more comfortable and more attractive. It means more people working both in industry and agriculture. Are you beginning to get the idea, Tommy? You are. It means a farmer like Dad is growing magic crops. That's right, Tommy. I guess you could change a handful of soybeans into a necktie by sleight of hand. But think of it. Chemergy actually does it. Say, why does anyone around here ask me about those packages I brought along? What's happened to children nowadays? Are they getting too polite? When I was your age, I was curious when any grown-up arrived with a package. I figured it might be something for me. Here's some material, Sue. Your mother can make you a new dress. Then you can tell your friends you're all dressed up in skim milk. And Tommy, here's a tie that was really made from soybeans. I guess that's magic all right, eh, Tommy? You bet, Dad. By the way, Tommy, didn't you lose a bet to your Uncle Jim? You said there wasn't an acre on our farm that was a part of industry, remember? I guess you're right, Dad. But we're partners now, Tommy. You're agriculture and I'm industry. You don't owe money between partners. Okay, industry, I'll shake on that.
log cabins, but they were free to live their own lives, to worship as they pleased, and to work their soil as they thought best. Even some industries were born in humble surroundings. In a log cabin in Clarksville, Virginia, a plow factory was started in 1825 and later became a part of Minneapolis Moline Company. The earliest plow used by man was a forked stick or branch of a tree. Later, he used animal power to help him plow. The plow the pioneer farmer used in America was roughly fashioned from wood and possibly reinforced with patches of metal. About 1830, the first steel plow made its appearance. Walking gang plows were introduced about 1867. The two-wheel sulky, which appeared about the same time, made it possible for the plowman to ride while he worked. For the pioneer, plowing was slow and arduous work, but in an atmosphere of freedom, there was no stopping the progress of man and machines. Today, there are plows of every size and description, for small farms, for large farms, and for different types of soil. The moldboard plows are direct descendants of the earliest plows, but they are made of the finest kind of steel. The plows scour smoothly in soil heavy and rich in organic matter. The shares are made of soft center steel, patented in 1868. The outsides are heat treated for added hardness, and the inner layer remains tough and strong. Disc plows, patented as early as 1847, are widely used on farms where the soil is such that moldboard plows cannot be used, or where it is desired to mix stubble with soil. On these one-way plows, seeding attachments are sometimes mounted so that the plowing and seeding can be done at the same time. In modern farmer, there are many special soil preparation tools. There are middle breakers or middle busters to prepare the soil for deep furrow crops. There are subsoilers to break up the hard pan that forms below the reach of plows. And there are two-way plows that will turn all the furrows in the same direction, eliminating a dead furrow. They are really two plows, one with right hand and one with left hand bottoms. The earliest harrows were tree limbs with branches for teeth to smooth the seed bed. A wooden harrow shaped like the letter A and hinged in the center was commonly used in the 1840s and 50s. Another type commonly used on cleared ground was the flexible wood bar type with iron teeth. On farms today, disc harrows are indispensable tools in seedbed preparation. They were first used in 1869. Now the discs are concave in design and the gangs can be angled hydraulically. On toolbars of various sizes, tillage tools of every description may be quickly mounted. Fields, pastures, and crop growing land can now be given the care they need to produce their best. The toolbars may be mounted on the tractor or on a pull-behind carrier equipped with rubber tires. Both types may be operated with hydraulic lifts. Mechanical power for farming had a slow beginning. Around 1860, a portable steam engine supplied belt power, but had to be moved by horses from job to job. About 1892, an experimental gasoline traction engine appeared that could propel itself forward and backward. Around 1900, wood and coal burning tractors took on a gay 90s appearance. Before World War I, Power steering was featured on this tractor. About the same time, this tricycle-type tractor appeared. After World War I, some tractors looked like automobiles. It is estimated that each farm worker has today 33 horsepower at his command. In 1920, he had only 5 and 3 tenths horsepower, and in 1870, only 1 and 6 tenths horsepower. The modern tractor is vision-lined or streamlined so that the operator can see what he is doing without unnecessary strain. 
The modern farmer has a choice of front end styles. Some tractors have single wheels in front for narrow rows. Others have two front wheels set close together for average rows, or two front wheels set apart but adjustable for width. There are also tractors that have two front wheels set a fixed distance apart. Tractors today come equipped to burn various kinds of fuel, gasoline, distillates, LP gas, or diesel fuel. On over five million farms in the United States today, there are now nearly five million tractors. Yes, men and machines are marching on. Until about 1850, planting was done the hard way, with a hoe. But in 1839, a start toward mechanization was made, with a corn planter patented that year. Around 1860, a two-row planter was used that dropped the corn in check rows for cross-cultivation. Sled marks were used as guides for the operator, who pulled a lever that released the corn. A mechanical seeder that broadcast the seed came into use in the 1850s. On farms today, mechanical planters mounted on tractors or on full-behind carriers are designed to handle with amazing accuracy seeds of any size. For crops like cotton that require deep furrows, there are planters that are equipped with lister bottoms. For today's planters, the farm owner has a wide choice of just the tools he may need for the type of planting he prefers to do. They have fertilizing attachments and hydraulic power to raise the planters for short, quick turns. Today's grain drill is also an achievement that is a boon to farming. It may be obtained with or without press wheels, with double disc or single disc furrow openers, with fertilizer and grass seeding attachments, and with mechanical or hydraulic power controls. The hoe was used for ages as a cultivating tool, but relief came to the man with the hoe about 1820, when the horse hoe was introduced. About 1856, a two-row, two-horse, straddle-row cultivator was patented. Later, a riding cultivator was introduced, and the man with the hoe no longer had to walk while he worked. Today, cultivating tools are mounted on tractors that provide easy and comfortable visibility for the operator. Tools and tractors are designed for high clearance so that cultivating can be carried on as long as possible. Even in the cotton field, tractor-mounted cultivators are doing easily and quickly a job that once took many hands and many holes to perform. For those who wish them, special tools and attachments are available for modern cultivators, including fertilizing attachments. For soils that may form a top crust following a rain, the rotary hoe or rotary hoe attachments for the cultivator have saved many a crop. One of the earliest hay cutting machines patented in 1822 was a mower with sides circular in shape. The two-wheel mower with hinged cutter bar set the pattern for mowing machines of the future. In time it replaced the combined mower and reaper, which introduced the reciprocating cutting knife. In the 1850s, baling was strenuous work. It took two men and a horse one hour to make five bales, each weighing 250 pounds. Hay is man's oldest crop. Because today, tractor mowers speed the job of harvesting hay, it need not be cut until it is ready, thereby adding more feed value to the crop. One man can bale the hay right in the field. An automatic baler picks up the crop from windrow, compresses it into bales that are square-cornered, ties the bales with two strands of wire, and counts them as they are dropped off. Today, machines that are easy to manage are also helping the modern farmer irrigate his parched lands. Threshing grain with flails is ages old, but it was still being done in the early 19th century. The invention of the reaper in 1831 is considered a significant milestone in the development of harvesting machines. 
years later, threshing machines like the Pride of the West, which was driven by horsepower, were becoming popular. About 1901, threshing machines like the Minneapolis had to be built for rugged service in the wheat lands of the Northwest and Canada. Harvesting corn was backbreaking work, but in the 1890s, corn binders helped relieve some of the drudgery. Shelling and grinding, even with horsepower, was slow work at first. Then about 1905, cylinder corn shellers like the Minneapolis helped farmers speed up this work. The modern farmer harvests his crop with machines that are the wonder of the world. He has machines that windrow grain if it ripens unevenly. He has pull-behind harvesters that can handle seed crops, grain crops, or soybeans. On larger farms, his pull-behind harvesters handle with equal efficiency grain that has been windrowed or grain that stands chin-high in the field. These machines have a tremendous appetite for work and handle the heavy straw with ease. On other large farms, self-propelled harvesters are helping the farmer garner his harvest. Large as the grain fields may be, these efficient modern harvesters, operated by just one man, are equal to the job. Large capacity harvesters now have hydraulic drives and power steering for smoother, easier operation even on hills. Mechanical corn pickers that handle one row or two rows at a time have taken the drudgery out of one of the most difficult harvesting jobs. The farmer today has a choice too of corn pickers. Some can be mounted on his tractor and removed when the job is done. Corn shelling is no longer the tedious, time-consuming job it once was. Some even find it profitable to mount their sheller on a truck and do custom work for their neighbors. On farms today, there is a machine that is unique in the history of farming. On a tractor that is new in design can be mounted a unit that picks and husks the corn or a unit that picks and shells the corn at the same time right in the field. The same tractor can be mounted units that will combine crops like soybeans or various other grain crops. Other units like a windrower or forager can also be mounted on this tractor. More than any other machine, it typifies the progress men and machines are making on farms today.